I'll tell you, you know, college hoops, a little bit of a quieter week this week. Um, you know, we talked a lot about the early week results on Wednesday show. Not really a ton has happened since then. So instead, what I want to do is actually want to start with a little bit of college football. It's been now about three weeks since the season ended, since Georgia took care of business against TCU. Um, and so the, the season itself is done. But as we now know, December into January is one of the most important times on the college football calendar period end of story. And that is because that is when a ton of transfer recruiting goes on. By now, you don't need me to tell you. The transfer portal, I don't know if in football or even in basketball, if it will ever truly replace solely recruiting, if it'll ever replace recruiting high school players, you still need great talent. And especially in football, the best way to accumulate the best talent is through the high school ranks. I do think that's still the case in college basketball as well. But with that said, you need to recruit the transfer portal and every school is looking for something a little bit different. Some, you know, are looking to, to, to flip over a roster. If you're Auburn and Hugh freeze or Deion Sanders, Colorado, uh, others are just looking for to to plug a hole or two, Jim Harbaugh, Michigan, et cetera, et cetera. So everything's a little bit different. But what was different specifically about this year in the transfer portal is that for the first time, we had transfer portal windows. Okay, remember, I actually talked about this about a year ago. People said, the transfer portal is out of control. How do we fix it? I said, the biggest thing, just have transfer portal windows. The transfer portal doesn't have to be Burger King. It doesn't have to be open 24-7, 365. Have it your way. That's okay at BK. It doesn't have to be this way at the transfer portal. So this year, what the NCAA decided to do, they were obviously listening to this show. They instituted transfer portal windows. Essentially, a player had about five to six weeks after the season ended to enter the transfer portal. And if they did not enter it, they were basically at the program that they were at until the spring when there will be another window for a two, three, four week period there. So why I bring it up, is because last week, the portal officially closed. Now, some players are still in the portal and still being recruited. But for the most part, all of the best players that were in the portal have committed to schools, and now it's time to start to look at who ended up where and what it means for college football in 2023 and beyond. So what I want to do now is look at winners from the early transfer portal window, knowing that, one, we're going to have a transfer portal window later, in the spring, again, after spring practice. But let's look at some winners from the transfer portal. Again, with the understanding, this isn't just a straight, you know, going by the ranking. It's going by who needed what, how many players did you get? Are you rebuilding? Are you trying to get just one or two players to plug and play? So let's get into the winners of the early transfer portal. The number one winner in the early transfer portal is actually one of the big winners from this time last year. And that was LSU and Brian Kelly. And what's interesting was this time last year, LSU just had holes. They were the Titanic. They had holes everywhere that they were trying to plug. Brian Kelly took about 24, 25 players, I believe, when it was all said and done last year when he took the job at LSU. Well, this year, coming off of an SEC West title, didn't have as many, many holes to plug, but he went after guys at positions of need, and he had a ton of success. So credit Brian Kelly. I think he was maybe the biggest winner. Here's what you need to know about LSU's recruiting hall. The number one player that they got is maybe the most interesting player in the portal, a kid named Denver Harris, who was from Texas A&M. If the name sounds familiar, he was one of the top ranked high school cornerbacks in the class of 2022, actually played quite a bit at Texas A&M. He was part of that Texas A&M recruiting class that was historic at this time last year. But why it's interesting is he was also suspended twice and essentially thrown off the team late in the season. And so why it's interesting is because this is a guy with a world of talent who could not make it work at Texas A&M. And now he is going to a place in LSU where discipline and accountability are kind of pillars of how Brian Kelly runs his program. So this to me is fascinating because what Brian Kelly is basically saying is, I believe that if we get him in our locker room with our culture, we will have the chance to turn this guy into a success story. He's probably the most high profile player that LSU signed. On top of that, they also signed a very interesting piece from Alabama, a kid named Aaron Anderson. Great name, by the way, Aaron, no big deal. Um, but Aaron Anderson was a very interesting player. 
high four-star recruit in last year's 2022 recruiting class like Denver Harris. And he actually committed to LSU out of high school. He's from New Orleans, uh, Edna Carr High School, which is an iconic high school football program in Louisiana, committed to LSU for Coach O. Coach O gets fired, decides to decommit, and goes to Alabama this year. Doesn't get on the field, but what is especially intriguing about this one Alabama lost a lot of guys to the portal, and I don't get the sense that Nick Saban was all that upset about most of them. Most of them probably realistically were not going to play next year or in the future at Alabama. But this was a kid that Alabama was upset about. This was a kid that Alabama saw in their future plans, and he decides to go home. A couple other noteworthy names that you should keep an eye on for LSU. Uh, one, I mentioned Denver Harris, the cornerback, but also on top of him, Zai Alexander, a cornerback from southeastern Louisiana. Yes, he came from the FCS level, but he is a guy that a lot of people believe can play at the highest level. Paris Shand, a defensive lineman from Arizona. Jordan Jefferson, they used to have a quarterback named Jordan Jefferson at LSU, a defensive lineman from West Virginia. Uh, a couple other D linemen, that seemed to be an area of priority for LSU. But I would argue LSU is maybe the number one team in terms of transfer rankings for this cycle. After LSU, here's who I got at number two, one of the, the really buzzy teams of the college football offseason. That is the Florida State Seminoles. And a couple things. One, Florida State, and we talked about them at the end of the season, but they are like the, the it team of the 2023 offseason. This past season, they go 10-3 and three in year three under Mike Norvell. They do a great job of retaining their players in this program. Jordan Travis, their starting quarterback, is coming back. Jared Verse, one of the elite defensive linemen in college football this year, decided to skip the NFL draft and come back. Florida State, I think, is interestingly, they seem to be at least publicly focusing their NIL efforts on retaining current players rather than going and paying for high school players. So I think that's very interesting, especially when they share a state and a rivalry with with uh, Florida, which we just know what happened with Jaden Rashada. But Florida State is a buzzy team, and their coach Mike Norvell has done a great job through the years of hitting the portal effectively. I just mentioned the kid Jared Verse, could have been a first-round pick, came in the portal this time last year. Jermaine Johnson was a first-round pick last year, came from the portal as well. This year, they're doing really good work in the portal. The names that you need to know for Florida State, Fentrell Cypress, and all ACC corner came from Virginia. This was a kid who could have gone anywhere, had offers from Ohio State. Ohio State doesn't recruit the portal a ton. This was a kid they prioritized. Michigan, Notre Dame all offered this kid Fentrell Cypress. He ends up at Florida State. Jaheim Bell. Very interesting name. Tight end from South Carolina is a great, not only pass catcher, but a runner as well. As a tight end, he was actually South Carolina's second leading rusher this year. He decides to hit the portal and goes to Florida State. Also, Braden Fisk, defensive lineman, was down to Florida State and Notre Dame. Came from the MAC, 12 sacks, five, uh, 12 and a half tackles for loss, excuse me, five sacks. Really good player. And then also an offensive tackle, Jeremiah Byers, who just about everybody wanted. Florida State, my number two winner in the transfer portal. Number three, and this one's really interesting because it shows how every program uses the portal a little bit differently. LSU had 12, 13 guys. Florida State had 12, 13 guys. We're going to get it to a team next that took 23 players so far in the portal. But this team that I want to get to, is a team that is good enough to win the national championship next year. And they really only had to plug a few holes, but boy, oh boy, did they do it. And that's the Michigan Wolverines. Michigan, obviously we've talked about them a ton, but this was part of the reason I said, it doesn't make sense for Harbaugh to leave right now. You have all these returning stars, but he also cleaned up early in the portal. In total, Michigan only took a grand total of seven players, but they got some good ones. First off, uh, two or really three potential starting offensive linemen. Remember, nobody does offensive line play better than Michigan. Ladarius Henderson from Arizona State. Miles Hinton, a multi-year starter at Stanford. Drake Nugent, another player from Stanford. Those guys all along the offensive line. Here's where it gets interesting. That defense added some very fascinating pieces as well. Ernest Hausman was a true freshman who balled out for Nebraska this year. 
decides to leave after Scott Frost gets fired. He has uh, he could have gone anywhere. He chooses Michigan. Some people believe he might have been the best defensive player in the portal outside of maybe Travis Hunter, who we'll discuss in a minute. Also, Josiah Stewart. That's also a name to know. Outside linebacker was at Coastal Carolina. Coastal Carolina's head coach, Jamie Chadwell, uh, decided to go to Liberty to replace Hugh Freeze, another guy who will be on this list later. And the uh, the player that I just mentioned, Josiah Stewart, was their best defensive player, 12 and a half TFLs, was the preseason Sunbelt freshman or, or, or freshman, def- or the preseason, let me start over. The preseason Sunbelt Defensive Player of the Year was a freshman All-American two years ago. That is Michigan's recruiting class again. They didn't take a ton of bodies, but they don't need a ton of bodies, and that's what's fascinating. They use the portal differently than some teams just to plug a few holes on what is a title contender. One team that has a lot of holes to fill. That sounded weird, but has a lot of of holes out of the portal. I'm talking about the transfer portal. Let's get to that team. I can't even keep a straight face if you're watching on YouTube. A lot of holes to fill. The Colorado Buffaloes. So Coach Prime, Deion Sanders, listen, this is not a secret that Colorado is a disaster. They were a disaster pre-Coach Prime, okay? One, they were the worst, at, maybe the worst power five team in college football last year. One and 11 overall. But two, you know how you know that Mich- that Colorado needed help? Through the portal, it's because it is opening meeting with the team. Deion Sanders said, I got my own luggage. I'm bringing Louie. He basically told the dudes in that locker room, you're not good enough. You got to go. And so in total, Colorado took, how about this, 23 commitments in the transfer portal. As best I can tell, that is the most of any Power 5 program outside of Arizona State, which is also having a new head coach uh, in Kenny Dillingham. But obviously with Coach Prime in Colorado, what's especially interesting is the players that he brought with him. Travis Hunter is the best player in the transfer portal. Was the number one high school player in America last year. Was set to go to Florida State. Flips to go to Jackson State. He is now coming with Coach Prime from Jackson State to Colorado. Shador Sanders. Coach Prime's younger son, quarterback, 40 touchdown passes this year. Coming to Colorado, we know he's going to be the starter. Shiloh Sanders, Coach Prime's older son. Now, he's not the oldest son, but the older son that played football for him last year at Jackson State. Shiloh Sanders is a very interesting player. He actually began his career at South Carolina, played in the SEC, transfers to play for his pops. Now he's back at the Power 5 level here. Beyond just the guys from Colorado or, or from Jackson State, a couple other names to know, and some of them will be familiar to you guys and girls who, who follow the SEC. Jordan Dominic, really good defensive lineman who played at Arkansas last year, is headed to Colorado. Uh, Miles Slusher, a safety who has started a lot of games at Arkansas, is headed to Colorado. Cavassier Smoke had a couple big years for Kentucky, kind of got lost in the shuffle behind Chris Rodriguez this year. He is headed to Colorado. So, Coach Prime. 23 players so far, and you know he ain't done. You know there's more to come, and you know that once the transfer portal reopens in the spring, he'll be taking more. Guys, let's keep it going with another first-year head coach that I think is really interesting in what he's done, and that is Hugh Freeze and the Auburn Tigers, okay? And Hugh Freeze, let me say this about Hugh Freeze, okay? First of all, this guy's doing exactly what I told you he was going to do. I told you Coach Prime was going to kill it in recruiting. And Hugh Freeze knows how to put together a roster that wins in the SEC. And what's especially interesting about Hugh Freeze is this. He has targeted the one spot that Auburn fans have been screaming about forever. Okay? Auburn fans dating back to the Gus Malzahn era have been begging their coach. Coach, can we work on the offensive line? Can we recruit some big guys up front? Can you do that for us, coach? Whoever our coach is, Gus Malzahn, Brian Harson. Well, Hugh Freeze has prioritized that in year one, off season one at Auburn. He has signed three elite offensive linemen. Dylan Wade, offensive tackle from Tulsa. USC wanted him bad. Chooses Auburn. Avery Jones, uh, interior offensive lineman from East uh, East Carolina, Illinois was he thought he was a done deal to Illinois. 
Brett Bielema's chirping about NIL this and blah, 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 blah. Goes to Auburn. Gunnar Britton, another offensive lineman at Auburn as well. Another interesting piece, Rivaldo Fairweather, a tight end who played at Florida International. This was a guy that has not played a lot of high school, uh, a lot of football in his career. Started late, but some people think this is an NFL caliber dude. He is headed to Colorado after leaving Florida International. On top of Auburn, and I know I already talked to LSU, I want to hit on a couple other very interesting SEC programs right now. One, the Kentucky Wildcats. And Kentucky is interesting because they're really a lot like Michigan. Now, Michigan's a national title contender. That's not Kentucky, obviously. But Kentucky, I, I think Mark Stoops feels pretty good about a lot of, of the guys on his roster already. By the way, I should mention back to Auburn for a second. Former Kentucky defensive lineman Justin Rogers did go to Auburn. Sorry, Kentucky fans. Sorry to bring that one up. I had to. But let's get back to Kentucky because I thought Mark Stoops and his staff did a really good job in the portal this offseason. Again, they don't have a million holes to plug. This is a season that even though it was a disappointment, the recruiting has been good. The talent is largely in the program. I actually think they're going to bounce back nicely next year. But I bring it up to say they got maybe the most important piece in the entire portal. And that was Devin Leary, the quarterback at uh, from North Carolina State. I would argue Devin Leary was the best quarterback in the portal this year. Maybe Sam Hartman, who committed to Notre Dame, was better. But Devin Leary was a guy people were talking about as a potential first-round pick a year ago, gets hurt at NC State in the 2021 season through for 34 touchdowns. He's coming back with Liam Cohen, the offensive coordinator, and they have a chance to be really good. Outside of Devin Leary, a couple interesting names. Ray Davis, 1,000-yard rusher at Vanderbilt. J.Q. Hardaway, a really elite recruit who spent last year at Cincinnati. He leaves when Luke Fickle leaves. Jansen Dunn, another uh, defensive back. He was at Ohio State. So credit Mark Stoops, credit Kentucky for getting the guys that they need to fill holes on the roster. Let's keep it going with another SEC team who had a very interesting, specifically the last week. That is the Ole Miss Rebels, okay? And this time last year, I thought Lane Kiffin did as well as anybody in the portal. He started calling himself the Portal King, got Jackson Dart, the, the quarterback from USC. What was interesting was, did you see what happened a week ago when Lane Kiffin took not one, but two high-level quarterbacks in back-to-back -back days? Walker Howard, the quarterback who played last season at LSU, former five-star guy, was buried on the depth chart behind Jaden Daniels, behind Garrett Nussmeyer. He decides to enter the portal. What was interesting, though, was he committed to a place where there's seemingly a starter already in place. That is Jackson Dart from Ole Miss. Here's the problem. Apparently, Jackson Dart is not the starter in Lane Kiffin's eyes because not only did he take Walker Howard, a day later, they took Spencer Sanders, a four-year starter at Oklahoma State. And so it looks like we are going to have a true three-person battle for the starting quarterback job at Ole Miss. I don't know if it's going to get settled in the spring. I don't know if it's going to get settled in the summer or if it's going to get settled in fall camp. And I'll tell you, there's, there's already going to be, we know, at least one transfer quarterback that is not happy with how things end. I'll be blunt. I didn't talk about the Spencer Sanders thing last week. There just wasn't enough time. I find it very bizarre. Fourth-year starter has one year of eligibility left, you get the wrong school, you get buried on the bench, you're out of eligibility, my guy. So we'll see what happens. I wouldn't be surprised if one of these guys transfers out this coming off season, but that remains to be seen. Ole Miss is another team that's intriguing. We'll wrap up with a couple more. One, I do want to give credit to the USC Trojans. Like LSU, they were a team that was really aggressive a season ago. Caleb Williams, Jordan Addison, whatever. They did not have to be as aggressive this year, but they got a few big pieces. Uh, Anthony Lucas, a five-star defensive tackle who played at Texas A&M, another one of those guys from Arizona originally, decides to transfer back out west. He's going to USC. Dorian Singer, um, a wide receiver who led the Pac-12 in catches at Arizona, is headed to USC. Marshawn Lloyd, South Carolina, the other USC's leading receiver, is headed to the other USC in, at Southern Cal. And the one thing about Lincoln Riley, you know he ain't going to rest. You know there's probably going to be somebody that emerges in the spring. Uh, Lincoln Riley, not afraid to uh, to, say, to be aggressive. Let's put it delicately, to be aggressive in the portal. 
Last team, you know what? I'll say this. Oregon, by the way, another team in the Pac-12 I thought did really well. Jordan Birch, defensive lineman uh, from South Carolina. Um, uh, Treshawn Holden, uh, a, a wide receiver from Alabama. Kyrie Jackson, a cornerback from Alabama, went there. Should mention, by the way, TCU did a very good job in the portal as well. Tommy Brockermeyer, former five-star offensive tackle, went to Alabama. Uh, who was the other guy? JoJo Earl, five-star from, uh, you know, went to Alabama. Trey Sanders from Alabama. As you can see, Alabama lost a lot of guys in the portal. They're going to be okay. Finally, I'll just say this. One team that I thought was actually very interesting and, and, and impressive, really, was Wisconsin. So Wisconsin, don't forget now. You know who Wisconsin's head coach is, right? Luke Fickle from Cincinnati went to Wisconsin this offseason. And Luke Fickle, very interestingly, hired a guy by the name of Phil Longo as his offensive coordinator. Phil Longo runs the air raid, essentially. Now, there's some running elements to it, but this was the guy at North Carolina that made Drake May a Heisman Trophy contender, that put Sam Howell in position to be a first-round pick, even though he didn't play that well last year. So, that guy is going to Wisconsin as the offensive coordinator, and they have established that they're going to pass the ball. Tanner Mordecai, a kid who many thought was going to enter the NFL draft. Tanner Mordecai was at SMU. He decides to do one more year of college football, and he ends up going to Wisconsin. He was a guy who threw for 33 touchdowns, 3,500 yards last year. C.J. Williams, a former five-star wide receiver at USC, is now uh, 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 headed to that school, Wisconsin. So he's got a nice number one target. And what I thought was interesting was they took a quarterback for the present for next year in Tanner Mordecai and a quarterback of the future, of the future, in Nick Evers, a former highly rated recruit who was at Oklahoma last year. So Wisconsin, I thought a very interesting team out of the Big Ten. 